everyone. Uh, this is the first day of the PSSC and we're very, it's a great honor for us to uh, have Professor Eduardo Fredkin. So let me just give a brief introduction to fill in the time. He <laughs> 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 got his master's degree from University of Buenos Aires, Venus, <laughs> from Argentina, and he got his PhD in Stanford, and uh, he's now a full professor at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. And he's one of the members of the United States National Academy of Sciences, and he has more than many, many uh, other works. So he's going to give three lectures today, tomorrow and the day after. It's going to be the first lecture on these three days, and today he's going to talk about uh, duality and condensed matter physics. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I wasn't too sure what I was expecting to do, so I chose the topic. And whether you're going to like it or not, we will see. Uh, the other thing is that being lectures, I thought I was going to give a blackboard talk. So this is my best approximation to a blackboard talk. That's what I said. So instead of using PowerPoint, I decided to use my bad hand writing. Uh, it was never good, but using a computer all the time was not bad. The other thing is that, uh, as the uh, center told you, uh, I'm originally from Argentina, we speak Spanish. That's my native language. We have only five vowels. English has like 26. So I will help you with my correspondences to the five universality classes that I have, okay, as best as I can. Sometimes it can be too interesting, but not so interesting for people. <laughs> okay, so uh, actually, thank you, Ali. <laughs> Love you. The words. Uh, you mentioned that it is going to be about hard condensed matter, and I think I'll start with the with the icing model or the easy model, as we should call it, uh, which is historically a problem of classical statistical mechanics, and these people normally take pride of not having an H bar, but you will see that it's secretly a quantum theory, and so there is actually no sharp divide in spite of the political appearances between these two things. So I, I hate these arbitrary divisions in physics. We learn a lot from different areas, but we need to cherish them. So uh, I have a sort of an outline. Is there a way to get rid of this stuff in time? To hide it? It's always actually just, just time to be able to go. I have you know, another. another uh, no, not the, the, no, thing, no, the thing on top, the problem is the five. So five. So the more is connected. Go to the more. More. Go to the more. Hide me the height. No, 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 floating. That's how it goes. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so this is the program for the rest of our lives. Okay, so we told that we did three lectures, probably some 50 things in three lectures. Uh, at the end of the day, okay, I'm going to start with very basic ideas of reality, some of which are historical, and one of the icing models. And the relation with gauge here, which is understood much later. The move to problems such as vortices and monopoles, and the more modern topics such as particle vortex duality, cross stabilization, visualization of duality, and later applications of these ideas to the quantum contract. Oh, I 
This is a note from here who was discovered actually originally by Iraq, back in April 31, who noticed that there is an apparent between <coughs> the charge term and the charge density, there is a symmetry in the mass of equations, which, which amounts to exchanging the electric and magnetic fields. So you could equally define it in terms of the charge density and the current density, or the monopole density and the monopole current. So this is an observation that Iraq may be also constructed the baby version of the Lanka version of the magnetic monopole in the form of a very thin flux field that ends up emanating a magnetic field that looks like much of an electric field. And he noticed that the observation in this sense between the electric charge and the monopole charge. So they have to obey what is called nowadays the <coughs> condition by Dirac, and this actually comes from quantum mechanics. Okay, so there is an alternative way of writing this equation in a more covariant form in, 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 in <coughs> using the field tension that we know. Some people call it something else, like the polarity tensor. <laughs> so they have to crack the joke. <laughs> <laughs> The field tensor of electromagnetism. So these two equations essentially are collapsed into this, where J mu is a four vector, the standard term is the density of the sum, and the current And this other equation here, this equation, essentially says that the dual of the tensor, dual of the form in this form, the density of the Gita tensor, this is for far synthesis. The divergence is zero, and the fact that this is zero, so that this is zero for the gain thing, and it means simply say that there are no molecules. So that's a very, and since, so as I said, the gain thing is to be seen to the inside. Now, what is actually hidden in these expressions is something that actually is a geometric character, and you can think of the geometric quality. <laughs> As a relation essentially common in differential geometry. So, if you think of the vector potential, which is people call it the one form in the language, we saw that use of terminology, and the field tensor, which is a line, second line tensor, which is a symmetric, two form with the differential geometry. Similarly, the dual tensor is also a two form, so there is a duality of forms in the vector modeling. <laughs> so, which says that the P form is the dual to a D minus P form where P is a dimensionality. So, in four dimensions, the field tensor, which is the second one form, in some sense is called dual because it's related to another tensor which has the same number of indices. In fact, we can actually construct linear combinations of the wave of dual that actually are invariant on the transformation. Okay, so this is a very simple version of that. In other dimensions, there are analogs of this, for instance, in two dimensions, think of this as one space of time, the dual or the scalar is another scalar, and this is usually, as you learn in kindergarten, this called the Cauchy-Riemann equation. Okay, when you learn your input, you know, complex analysis and all of that, at least in my kindergarten, you are talking. <laughs> Okay, it's not so this is the potential and these are the lines and so it's the same. It's the same concept as we can see. So it's not totally unfamiliar to you. Maybe it should be. Okay, so let me go now to the analysis model. There is a fundamental principle of theoretical physics. If a new idea that doesn't work in the icing mode, then it doesn't work. Okay, so you first try to be icing mode. So let me go back to the history. 
So as we know, it's a, it's a more than one reason. We just think we have things from that list, so we can use that, so we can take one and take one and one. And the partition function is at least I have said it is change constant to one, or rather the temperature is moving to the near its object. Okay, so it was well this is a thing it's famous for giving the name to this model. Actually, the model was suggested to him by his advisor. This thing couldn't solve it, and he had mentioned one, one, and then found that there was no phase transition. And then in conjecture that you will never have a phase transition unless you have long range interaction, which is wrong. <laughs> um, years later, pilots actually showed that this is not true due to a proliferation to the role of domain walls. And you will see how the role of domain walls appeared. 1941, Kramer and Nia, and they were the end of brother, two different people. They compare the high temperature expansion and low temperature expansion and low. So the high temperature expansion, essentially what you do is you expand this in powers of one over T, T is high, this is called parameter. And then if you trace over these things, you basically get close contours of this analysis. The contours are only three, you are not supposed to overlap, so it's uh, the interactions here which are important. But this essentially is a sum of the sum of the sum. The loops are closed. The low temperature expansion is an expansion of only ferromagnetic state. This state. So to give you more you start with one state, everybody up, or everybody down, everybody up here. And then you begin to you know, flip clusters of spins one at a time. Yes. So, so you can see an example of a cluster, and the cluster has a boundary, the boundary is for the domain walls. So you have to send now a very close contours because you're in two dimensions, these are closed contours. And so in a sense they look very much like the high temperature series, except it's an expansion not in powers of 1 over t, or the hyperbolic tangent of 1 over t, as it happens, this way, but in powers of e to the minus 2 over t. Which is sometimes called the Lumen factor for reasons that we can't clear. Okay, so they actually conjecture. Of course, these two expansions have a finite in the thermodynamic limit. They are not compatible with each other. They have a finite values of convergence. But if you are bold, and they were bold, they said, well, assuming that there is actually a single phase transition, it will happen at a place where the Expansion, the two expansions are equivalent, so we can call the stuff dual. Right? So it's why is it dual? Because these are coming from the dual lattice, the lattice are from the positive lattice. So that's the simple version of duality sandwich. So if you actually pose this, you can have an equation for the critical temperature, which was actually rewrite or obtained by an assignment in the Spectacular, probably one of the most important papers in theoretical physics in the 20th century, where he actually solved this problem, the partition function, secretly in terms, even though he didn't actually say that, in terms of a theory of free Majorana fermions, as we call them now. So the language has been changed over time. Okay, so this is a historical note, but you can see here the duality here is going from the direct to the dual lattice. And there is another form of duality which I will not elaborate much. If you have a more general theory with some general symmetry group, it is also a duality that relates the representations of the group to the group itself. And if the group is abelian, in this case, the representations are one dimensional, so they form another group. In a general, not a general theory. <coughs> So a little more of this, so you can see that. So in two dimensions, the way you can think about it is the direct matrix. So it's a two sides, and these are the sides in the dual matrix. So you can see, in one case, you have essentially contours of the direct matrix, and these are essentially the domain models of the dimension of the sides. And the important thing <laughs> is that in two dimensions, links are dual links. Okay, so it's a relation between the direct matrix and the dual matrix, which also exists in the field of crystals. Which is the 
when five dimensions is more true because they make the two dimensions is equal to a circle, so it's okay because you want to see one more. And this actually makes an important difference. Is this clear? I'm sure you have seen this before. I don't know if you have seen it. So the notice is that essentially you have two different expansions. It's an expansion in loop, so then you come back to this. And in this other case, an expansion in the world, which in two dimensions happen to be loops. And that's the case, especially in two dimensions. So the fact that this actually has a finite radius of convergence, and not a vanishing radius of convergence, is the observation that pilots made that there has to be a phase transition at some kind of critical temperature. He didn't know what the temperature was, but it was there. Now, there is a few things in the interpretation of this. So, imagine now that I think of one of the directions that I've done this as a so called like discretized imaginary point, and the other as a discretized space. Okay, so we can imagine you have some, you know, two, some configuration of space here. And you go row to row, and the given configuration that are the same. So this looks like the time evolution of some state as you go up in this imaginary time. And there is a matrix, so the transfer matrix, that tells you how to go from one row to the next. And the transfer matrix in this classical model takes place the same way as the unitary evolution, the time evolution in quantum mechanics, except that this is imaginary time and it's discretized. Okay. So this is actually what people that do quantum of the garden have to do. They have to take the problem in continuous time, they have to discretize it, they call it the throttle discretization. And so they map it to a problem like this itself. Of course, this is a simple problem because it's pretty so real, so there's no <laughs> sign problem for reasons that are not discussed. Yeah. Okay, but you can interpret the high temperature expansion groups as processes in which a pair of particles are created in this case. So here, for instance, a group is born, and then two particles are created, they go up to time, so they see two particles, and then they collapse and get destroyed, and they are created and destroyed in pairs. The same can be said about the low temperature expansion groups, but they have a different interpretation. They also can be good with this particles. These particles are not free because these groups have restrictions, so there are short range interactions between these particles. So if you can see the moment this actually has to be like some sort of field theory in one space, one time. So in this sense, the Classical d-dimensional IC model is equivalent to a quantum version of the IC model, otherwise known as the IC model transverse field, uh, in one supposed dimension. And this is a problem, for instance, that is studied in many magnetic systems, for instance, with a large uniaxial mesotropy. So you essentially can be invited to IC models, for instance, chrons and the chron lattice are examples of that. Uh, and then essentially by tilting the magnetic field, you can get the transfer field that is essentially undergoing the executing the okay, So it's a very standard problem, and in this case, it's actually safe. Okay, but, so it's the same problem, but it has a different interpretation. Uh, in reality, and we, uh, I'll come back perhaps to this in a second, we're talking about concentration of the duality, there is actually another way of thinking of the problem when you put together both the direct and the dual at this by realizing that this is actually a theory of terms. So this is in a sense what they don't say it. Okay, so let's talk about the quantum icing I'm going to show you a quantum, a more quantum mechanical version of the duality than we can going to some of you. So this is a spin chain. These are things that I knew when I was very young student at the time, so it's good. I'm going to do something that, uh, what's his name? Ken Wilson said in his Nobel lecture that, like all black graduate students who kept working with his thesis over and over again, he was lucky he was Nobel Prize for that. 
Okay, I will get that lucky, but I still like to work on those problems. So, good work. So, it's a nice symbol. As you can see, in the transfer sheet. So, this is a Sorry for those of you who are going to find the information. People like to call this x1 and this x3, and just the old fashioned because the signal one was simultaneously found in the Okay, let's well, say with periodic bundle conditions. Again, we have the same idea, the coupling constant here. When the coupling constant is small, this term dominates. Okay, and the ground state is unique. This is an eigenstate of sigma one. Okay, we have this unique ground state. And this is actually an expansion of our lambda, which is a real version, is the analog of the high temperature expansion of the <coughs> In the classical picture. Okay, again, we have this order, and you can see that essentially this is when this guy acts, it creates essentially two basis pairs, so essentially places where sigma one goes from being plus one to minus one, and this are the particles that they want to Now, in the limit where lambda is large, then the ground state is going to be more than the and this is the other of the low temperature expansion. Sigma 1 actually from here and create the sigma 3. That's going to introduce the main walls, places where the local temperature expansion changes. This is a quantum version of this. Now, this theory, same as in the classical case, of let me discuss it as a quantum problem, has a global safety of symmetry, which is essentially the symmetry between most things at the same time. So it's a discrete symmetry. There are two possible, we say, as a group, as a transformation group, as an identity, and the spin theory. That's all there is to it. The operator that executes the spin theory is the product of the single one is everywhere. It commutes with Hamiltonian because it commutes with this term on the and it commutes with this term because it flips all of the spin simultaneously and they appear in the Okay, so it's a Constant motion, if you want. So you could, in principle, diagonalize this problem in the subspace where q is equal to 1 or minus 1. Why 1 or minus 1? Because it's flipped towards the identity. Okay, so diagonalizes are 1 and minus 1. I think it works. <laughs> All right, so let me show you the quantum version of the model. So let me come here. In my yellow chalk line, we have to the red lattice and the blue crosses. Assuming the other thing is, in addition to having only five hours, I am colorblind. So, so my choice of colors is sometimes inadequate. <coughs> so these are the midpoints of the lattice. They form another one dimensional chain, and this is usually it's also called the blue one. It's called the same reason. And let me define the following operator. So the product of two sigma series of nearby sides of the electron is going to be called tau one. I, I mean it's another problem of the function, it's where in the identity and they commute with each other. Okay, we can do that. So we call it tau one on the dual side, which is between the sides j and j plus one from j two. And let me call tau three an operator. That is a product of sigma ones from essentially the nature of the universe up to side j, including side j. What this operator does, it flips half of the spin, so it creates domain rules. You may call it a king creation operator, a solitary creation operator, but in the end, and then that also will be that. Now, the product of two countries. So we say if you have two sides of the table and the tau two sides of the previous side, it's equal, if you can see the formula, to sigma one of the side of J, which flows in between. Now, what do, you, what do you mean by <coughs> uh, the edge of the universe? That will work with periodic boundary conditions. I'm joking. So oh, no, no, I'm 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 but, uh, okay, so there's an issue with boundary conditions, yeah, yeah. yes, and assuming it's periodic, and then there is something you have to do with. With the first, essentially, with the link that relates the last side to the first side. And so, you really have to decide at that point in your term, in your do what I'm about to do, that involves this Q operator acting on that link, that involves everyone. 
So if I work in a sector where Q is one, I can create one of the conditions in this dual form, and Q is one is one, and I have to do that at the end of the Thank you for the question. That's important. That's actually one of the components of the end of the series. But the point of all this is that this operator essentially maps into this operator, and this operator maps into this other operator. So you say, in some sense, the dual theory is the same theory, that's what we call Sartor, except that the coupling constant is the reciprocal of the coupling constant, after the definition of the overall energy scale. Also, you can see that we can conjecture that if there is a unique phase transition, we can only find the equals one. So that is actually correct. So, so the one thing he has is virtue that essentially relates two problems and sometimes have two different theories. In this case, it's the same theory. From weak coupling to strong coupling. And sometimes you may be able to do, make approximations in one regime and not in the other regime. Because you may not know how to do strong coupling, you know, the strong coupling analysis, but using duality, you can get to a place where you are more confident. Okay? So you can actually get a lot of insight even without knowing how to solve the problem before using the <coughs> And here you can even conjecture, assuming the transition is unique, that this is true. Now, there are many systems in one dimension that quantum systems that share this property. Some can be in transitions, but some don't. So we're not get into that case. Well, let me go up to three more three dimensions in a classical system. So in three dimensions, now the high temperature expansion is still the sum of the group configurations. It's the same argument I had before. I can come back to this construction and the dimensionality did not enter here. It's just a count of In other words, the entropic factors in these expansions are different in different ways. Okay, it's still a sum of a close group configurations. And but the low temperature expansion is still the sum of the domain laws, but the domain laws in dimensions higher than two are not closed contours. They are closed surfaces in three dimensions, and closed under surfaces in four dimensions, and so on and so forth. So now the duality doesn't map it to a system which is like the same problem we just started with. We match into something else. We have two different expansions. One is an expansion into a cube, the other is an expansion into a surface. And look at the following. So if I use my field theory analogy and think of this as this two times in time, so this is essentially a, supposed to be essentially a closed domain model. In three dimensions, with my best effort in mind. You can see also that my drawing ability is doing a lot to be desired. Okay, so this is uh, this kind of sausage, which is actually an example of that. It could be actually sausage, you find that it's another part, but I decided not to go over that. So, before in two dimensions, I made the case that essentially this is practical interpretation, but the notion of the word lattice. So you still have a part of the interpretation. Now, if I want to use the same interpretation, what I have is not two particles, but actually a scan that evolves in time. So you can think of the low temperature expansion as a sum of processes where the scan born the rows. It may actually sprout other streams, so you may end up to something with more complicated topology, and then it will disappear. So, string theory. Okay, it's in the ice and mud. And a professor in this uh, house, but not in this building, Professor has been trying to use these ideas from since 1979 to actually solve the three dimensions of the ice and mud exactly. And I tried the same for a few months. I probably should take a show in the Boston solve but such that I still in the, I think he's still trying. Here, once in a while, he actually puts out another paper on that. Um, I followed the advice by another professor from Princeton, William Reed, who said that any theoretical physicist who wants to be called such 
custom spent a few six months of piece of paper, I get one piece of the 3D icing mold, but not more than that. So I get my full of beauty, I'm done with it. <laughs> it's actually the interacting, it's a theory of interacting fermionic strings, which cannot be used by the methods of relativistic string theory, unfortunately. It's an interesting problem for quantum information, as it turns out. But it's not the problem that we saw in the video. Okay, so, so now you see the dual is a different theory. And now you need to figure out what is that theory. So it's not going to be an icing model. It should have the same symmetry as the icing model because still everything should square to one. The zeta symmetry is still there. But it has to be a theory that in the regime, so we need a low temperature expansion or the high temperature expansion, so like that. So it's a theory of strings, essentially, with three surfaces in time. Okay, that actually was done by Franz Wegner in 1971. You can see there are many decades. So you need to measure the progress in this problem in a logarithmic scale. Okay. There are many decades that are involved. Okay, and uh, he showed that the dual it's actually a theory defined not on links, so the spins in the magnet, I mean, they live on sites and they interact on links. So he actually showed that the dual is a theory where the analog of the spins are the least of the dual of links, but they interact on the traces of the cube, nowadays for a long time called plaquettes. So the symmetry is still Z2. And the theory that does the job is this one here. So essentially, this is written as a, as a Gibbs wave, if you wish, with a coupling and spin coming in one of the T, but for this theory. Now, this theory has a huge symmetry. The icing mode has a global symmetry of flipping all spins at the same time. Whereas here, because there are four spins in every bracket, if I flip all of these spins, I say you know, there is a freedom that live on the links and share a site and here, then all of the plaquette interactions are invariant on the top. And this can be done locally. It's a local symmetry transformation. It's the analog, it's actually the simplest example of what we call a gauge transformation. And it takes only a few steps to relate any two configurations which are equivalent to each other under this transformation. So it is not possible to actually break the symmetry spontaneously. We might have heard an incorrect term of spontaneous breaking of the H symmetry. That doesn't exist. It's only global symmetry can be broken spontaneously, not the global symmetry. Okay, so it's a sun, this theory actually is the expansion, so it's a expanding powers of one over T. Because they can, for the time you have to view these plaquettes together, so if you know the story, you will get the section of the surface of the cube. So instead of being a cube group in two dimensions, it's a close, essentially cube in three dimensions. So, so the amount of the, other, the high temperature expansion, which you see is for the strong cutting expansion in the high temperature literature, so this, this theory actually. Well, it's the sum of the surfaces with this weight, which is in fact a colonic energy of one or two raised to the surface, and there will be essentially the the process of the crop. Well, the analog from the lower <coughs> field essentially is the case where the theory turns out to be, as you see, normal in the moment for the decon phi, is a sum of the closed loops of the lattice. So essentially, this theory has the same. Duality that we found in the construction of the icing model. There are two different expansions, one in the sum of the surfaces, the other one loops, but they occur and they are flipped relative to each other. So, in a sense, this problem is the dual, but this actually is the dual of the icing model, so the diagram is the generalized problem of the dimensions. And now the duality, instead of being the duality of links, as we saw before, that in 2D, a link on the dual lattice is to, and if you want to link on the, uh, on the direct lattice is linked to, is dual to a link in the dual lattice. Now what happens is that a link, or a 
Then the poor people are sexually killed and they get stoned and rolled away to impunity. So it's decomposed. Okay, so I've come to learn to talk about this in the moment because it's a little bit free. So the unknown of the correlator, as well as in the world, actually creates a flux field of Z2 flux field that ends at two magnetic molecules. It's like a defect in this field. Okay, and then in the theory we just have confinement, it turns out that the flux field, which is the goal of this, goes to the opportunity, goes to cost. So you can think of this here that exceeds this very low behavior as an example, as a bonding sign of these molecules, because they don't cost anything. So this is another, uh, essentially, you could call it a slogan. It's, a, it's another idea that you should keep in mind that theories of this type usually, so if the monoclons are confined and common and condensed, if they proliferate, the charges are confined. You know this example from superconductivity. So you have a superconductor, <coughs> which is a charge condensate, and you try to and you put inside a superconductor a solenoid, and you try to crank it a little bit here, there will be flux expulsion. It's called the Meister effect. And the energy cost due to the solenoid is proportional to the length of the solenoid. So why is this? Because this is an electric condensate. And therefore, the magnetic monopoles, which are the endpoints of the solenoid, are confined. So, this theory is sort of a reverse of that. Some people call it the dual superconductivity theory. You can see even the terminology has been used differently. Okay, so let me look at the quantum version of this. Of course, the other model, <coughs> which we mentioned, is classical model, brought you to a quantum problem in two space and time. Which is just the same model we discussed before. Except that there is more than a two dimensional lattice instead of one dimension. The dual, which is the other picture, essentially we have a term, which would be the analog of this, but now we use some packets, and the analog of this term is there is some mix, flips, and this is what it is. Same as before. Okay, where is the local symmetry? Well, the point is that the analog here we have a global operator that flips both screens at the same time and produces a kind of curve. Now we can do this locally. We can take this is a two dimensional lattice. This implies four sigma fields. So then we decide to call it a star. In this case, it's the operator which is called the star operator. It's a product of the sigma ones around the side, so we call the star operator. Okay, these operators commute with each other in the area and commute with the kind of term. This is the statement that there is no propagation of this. We have a local symmetry. And so that means that, in some sense, this description is redundant, and all these states which are invariant <coughs> and then these transformations are allowed. So you need to restrict the Hilbert space to the physical Hilbert space where Q is equal to 1. Now, this is the analog of the Gauss flow in quantum electrical dynamics. It's the discrete version of this. So, I mentioned this because this is going to, we're going to have a topic called the moment, which is also a popular problem to think about these things. Okay, so again, let me look at the duality, the quantum version of the duality. So the direct lattice I have in my equations, which I give you will be the mix. The dual lattice is red now, red, red, so it's red. It's not green. It's red. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the green on the sides. Okay, so the product of the sigma series, you remember what we did before. It's the same construction. What I did is to take the product of the sigma 3s became pi 1, and the product of 2 pi 1s became sigma 3. I'm going to do the same here. Okay, so the product of the sigma 3 is going to be like it. I'm going to put it power 1 in the dual side, which is red. 
of the sigma one, which is over here, is going to be the theorem <coughs> of two transcripts. Which I can do it that is the actual construction of the three transcripts of the local, is actually the string operator that wants at that point. It's the operator that is the element that creating this monopole. And if you go to MIT, it's for the right side. <coughs> it's the same option. So the gauge invariant sector of the theory then the cast and country constant of G that match to the coupling constant of the IC or lambda as one of it. So again it's strong to weak. It's the same logic. Right. Okay, so here you see the duality, this is the gauge theory, you can touch the coupling constant G, and this is the I symbol in the dual version. And you can see that the difference between the two is a very different constant Now, these theories are, there is no such duality now. They are dual to each other, so there is no reason for lambda equals one to be anything special. But it means that this theory we know has a phase transition and some critical lambda between the order phase and the disorder phase. Therefore, this theory should also have a phase transition between this confined phase and the deconfined phase. If you go to four dimensions, which is what I was trying to do when I was a Gerber student, so three plus one, there this theory is actually self dual is the analog of the one dimensional isomodal transfer. The difference is that have a huge first order transition, so it's not so long and it's not as nice as the one dimensional. But you can still learn about it. So, in this case, again, links are below the packets and packets are below the links. Yeah. Uh, so, where does the periodic versus anti periodic contradiction? It's the same problem here. If you have the same issue, they are boundary terms. And now the boundary terms may go seams around the lattice where things actually may get flipped. Those usually go under the name of the uh, dust to dust and uh, dust magnetic operator, which I may know from safety reasons. So just, <laughs> just here, uh, before tau one was this product of a long string and you had some reference site, it seemed natural how it came about. But here is just a single tech cup, it doesn't seem to be that same. Well, so you can do that so for for tables and then you can decide what you do at infinity. So you can you don't need to actually go all the way around. Otherwise you can do it if you work on torus. They, you know, seem they go through the um, focus path, or you may go along the long way around the universe, and they're good because the product of the only one. So there are two equations. <coughs> but it's true that the boundary conditions are important, and you see what the So notice now in particular that the large G element of this field. This equation is equivalent to the disorder, which is this what I'm calling the different kind phase, to the disorder phase of the acid molecule in the blood molecule. So let me talk about the physical picture of this, which is important. Let me come to this theory again. And I'm going to do the expansion powers of G and the expansion powers of one of G. So, in the quantum mechanical problem, we can start with the ground state, as you can choose the ground state, the other and the signal ones are equal to one, which you need to see the next state. The first excited state essentially was called the closed loop, <coughs> which in this kind of here would actually come around and produce loops of places where sigma one is not this one. So, so you get this expansion in terms of closed loops, the analog of one. So these are the strengths that I was referring to before, because this actually in conservation theory you do that at one time, and then you have to destroy it at the end of the time. You think of this in that direction, you can think of it. So it's the strength of this form, the works and the energy So at as GC, at the critical point, this looks to come out of the now. And in that sense, it's proliferated. In fact, if I go to the regime 
Whereas in Zoch, we can approximate the computer just by the computer and still demand the Turing sequence to work. Okay, because I don't do that sector. And this is where it's usually quantified design is totally correct. This theory turns out to have no previous dependence in boundary condition. So if you actually work on a, essentially on a large square with fixed boundary conditions, the one state is unique. But if you close it, say, on a torus and work with periodic boundary conditions, it has a form from genus. And it's the simplest example of the topological phase. And when I was a graduate student, we were interested not in deconfinement because we thought it was trivial. We were interested in confinement, so we never thought about boundary conditions. That's why it took many years for somebody to take a look at that. And the first one, I think, was the guy. Although there may be a footnote in the paper by Britain from 1989, where he mentions it. Okay, so the, the point is that, but you see, the dual theory has a unique ground state. Even on the torus. And the dual theory has a four fold genus in the torus. In fact, if you go into higher dimension, to more complicated surfaces, as Shogun showed in the early 90s, you get a genus that actually grows exponentially with the topology of the surface. Like two to the, essentially, four in this case, four to the number of handles that the surface has. Okay, so this is actually the simplest topological theory there is. And this is what people now at Google say they have finally solved. I can show you how to solve it. You don't need to have a quantum computer to solve this problem. They can simulate it. One of these days you will solve a non-trivial problem, and then I will be real happy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you need to criticize people. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. But there is a bit of a subtlety here because I told you that the ground state here is unique and here is not unique. So in a sense, it's a many to one correspondence here. For any one of these topological sectors, we have the same duality, <coughs> but they are in equivalent sectors. Okay. And this has to do essentially with the behavioral theory on large gauge transformations. And here you have to look at low, small, so called small or local gauge transformations. So if I work on the surface, which is as well as you can have gauge transformations that wind around in different directions, and that's actually the origin of this How much time do I have? Uh, 30. 30 minutes. Do you guys want to have a break? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because we're going to go to theories before this is a monopause now. Maybe you can stretch your legs, let's have a five minute break. Maybe you can go find that. Yes, you know? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, okay let's go on. <laughs> okay, are there any questions? <laughs> okay, so we're going to discuss now a similar problem involving vortices and no. You will see there is some analogy, but the physics is this. Okay, so we're drawing from a discrete symmetry, the two to a continuous symmetry. The one, the simplest example, is a problem when you have, say, a complex order parameter, which has an amplitude. <coughs> Many examples of this could be a classical magnet with easy plane symmetry. It could be a superfluid, superconductor, if I know the or an incommensurate charge density wave, and there are many examples of problems that have this type of nuance. So the global symmetry simply means changing the phase of the field, shifting it by some amount alpha. 
this symmetry is allowed. In the case of a charge density wave, if it is commensurate, this can be done only for some certain angles or phases because that's a discrete current state. But if it is incommensurate, it can slide the entire profile. So the order phase is the place where this object has an expectation value. So this is a global symmetry, just as the second phase we had before. But now it's a continuous. So the physics is a little different. The, in that case, the order phase has an amplitude, and it will have some, and the phases themselves may fluctuate. So this is what we normally call the Goldstone Goldstone loss. So a spontaneously broken globally one symmetry. Okay, so in, in this case, in the <coughs> W case, is either with the sliding symmetry, in the superfluid is a phase mode, or sometimes called the sound mode. Of a superfluid and a superconductor, there is the same thing in the classical spin system takes y symmetry, there is an analog. So we all have this the ghost on them. Of course, you can go to more complicated theories with more complicated symmetries like SO3 and so on. The number of ghost on modes grows. I'm going to say we need a new one with the quality arguments. So in the order phase, where the temperature is low, I can assume that I am deep in the phase where the amplitude exists. So I'm going to assume that this is roughly speaking constant, and, but the phase fluctuates. So you have a simple partition function now of seemingly a free field, which can be Gaussian rules with a simple property. There is an issue that secretly this phase has to be periodic with period two parts. So it's not entirely free in this case. It has to be compacted. We will come to that. The quantity I call G as a coupling constant is the temperature measured in units essentially of the stiffness. So stiffness being the amplitude squared times J, which would be the exchange constant in my Simple problem. So a system like that, because let me say for the moment I'm in two dimensions, can <laughs> vortices. So these are vortices where the phase actually winds by two pi times an integer around some closed loop, and there has to be some singularity here when the amplitude, if I work in the continuum, the amplitude of the has to vanish here, or the actually they go up. So the total change is an integer in units of two pi. So if I take a close oriented loop and I go around that and measure the total change in the phase it has to be an integer multiple of two pi. That integer is called the vorticity and I can essentially write this as an integral of the gradient. Okay, we'll come to a relation with the current in a moment in units of two pi. You can write it in this form if you want but it's actually quantized to be an integer due to the periodicity. So the phase can be viewed as a map of the contour itself, uh, to the value of the phase of the phase field, which is essentially a complex number of modulus one. So it's another circle. So this is topologically a circle. <laughs> And the image is another circle. In topology, in the theory of topology, of entropy groups, this is essentially mapping of a base phase, which is equivalent to a topic to a circle, which is called the base, to a target, essentially, which in this case is this phase field, which is another circle. And these uh, mappings can be smoothly deformed into each other. But they form, they fall into classes which are parameterized by integers, which are this. So usually, this is called pi one of s one. So the quantity m, the vorticity, is the winding number. Okay. Now, in the superfluid version, also in the magnet, if you want. 
the gradient, I'm using here mu, this is still you know, in the Euclidean space, the mu could be x and y. It is the gradient of the phase is essentially the current. And I can define the vorticity as the curl of the curl. Yeah, because if you compute the curl of the current, you see, since the current is the gradient of the phase, then you get an anti-symmetric tensor here, <coughs> seemingly a symmetric tensor here, and say, wait, with a minute, that means it's zero. Well, it is zero, okay, if theta is single value. But if theta is multivalued, if it has branch maps, it's not. In particular, the branch curve is it's going to jump. So this uh, essentially is not, uh, this uh, cross derivatives essentially don't, don't agree. And that's precisely the jump by two pi times a minute. So imagine you have a set of vortices located at, could be vortices and anti-vortices, M could be positive or negative, Take any values for the moment at some locations. Let me call them x sub j. And let me call this m sub j m sub j. So I'm going to call them the topological charge. So the vorticity I'm going to assume is essentially is located, is condensed, is entirely present here. So it's essentially a singular field, which is a, is a sum of delta functions with the weight, which is 2 pi times m sub j. So they say so could be positive negative. Yeah. Now, if I go back again to my kindergarten complex analysis, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was told that the delta function can be obtained if I compute, if I work on the complex plane Z, x1 plus i x2, take the logarithm and look at the imaginary part that precisely looks at this you see that it's actually not necessarily. It has a branch cut in it. Okay. So you can simulate the branch cut with this. So if you compute this quantity here, essentially it's just a delta factor. It's another way of writing the delta factor. Yeah, people say that I'm a complicated person because I like to scratch my right ear with my left arm. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the way of doing it. <laughs> All right. So let me define a field fancy theta, theta <coughs> which I'm going to define as the dual of the phase field, in the sense of the dual of the current, okay? In the sense of this duality of forms, the Koch dual. They satisfy this equation, which is again the cauchy riemann equation. <laughs> it's exactly what the cauchy riemann equation where one is the potential and the other is the flow. Use that analogy. Except that this quantity, fancy theta, satisfies the conventional Laplace equation rather than Poisson equation, where the negative of the Laplacian is the vorticity. This is another way, so going to the dual picture, you see that this guy here, this the vorticity is the source of the Okay, so, well, of course, in the same class, they told me how to solve these equations. It's an inhomogeneous partial differential equation. Use a green function. Okay. Yes? Is fancy data also a phase? Uh, we're going to come to that. It's also compact. Yes, and that's important. So, the, you can essentially use a green function to do that. And it's a green function for the Laplacian. And in two dimensions, it's essentially a logarithm. And this is what the green function is. The quantity A is a short distance cutoff. And this, in a sense, is valued for x minus y large compared to A. And normally, you regularize this so that when x and y differ by less than A is zero. So now regular. So suppose I want to compute the energy of these vortices. What I need to do is to plug in the expression of the energy, because that's actually what's in my partition function here. here. Okay. So if I plug in that, and I know the relation between theta, this theta, and fancy theta, 
then I can relate this to the vortices. Then it looks like the vortices are actually coupled to each other through this green function, which is a logarithm. So if you do a calculation, you can show you can do this, you can write it in terms of this form, provided the total vorticity is zero. That's important. Because otherwise this is infrared diverse. Why? Because of this logarithm here. So if there is a net vorticity, the configuration to net vorticity can zero with equal to nine to three. The only neutral configurations, that means that there should be as many positive as negative. <laughs> so that means that I can approximate this partition function in terms of a gas of point particles with logarithmic interactions that usually is called the Coulomb gas of two dimension. And this is a partition function now with this log interaction with some effective coupling that you well, this is what these two people did. <laughs> Michael Kostelitz and David Tavles, who shared the Nobel Prize with Duncan. And uh, this is a fraction of their contribution to the Nobel Prize in the so-called Kostelitz Tavles transition. It explains how what happens to the body to the motion superfluid and many of these things. So the way you understand this, I'm sure you have seen this, but I want to go through this argument just for the sake of definiteness for later, you can compute the free energy of a vortex by computing the energy and the entropy. Of course, in the regime, if you are low temperature, you expect the entropy to be small and the energy may dominate. So in that regime, essentially, because the vortex is actually having these logarithmic interactions, they cannot consist of isolation. In that sense, they are confined into dipoles. Dipoles can be bigger or smaller, but here in dipoles, but there will be a value you can compute the entropy. So the energy is logarithmic, but the entropy is also logarithmic because it's a log of a number of places where I can put my work. It's a log of the number of available states. So the free energy, which is this construction here, will become zero. So it will be positive if t is low, but at some point the entropy is going to be the energy at some critical value of t. And if you plug it in, you get this uh, famous value by Kostelitz and Thaulis, which in units of the stiffness is pi over 2. Okay, so this is a simple argument. And now you'd say, OK, at low temperature, the vortices are suppressed. They are bound into dipoles. And at high temperatures, they proliferate. It's not only condensing what is in matter state. I call them proliferation. <laughs> so there are lots of orbits. Okay? Still, they have to be neutral. So they form, essentially, they say it's a plasma. And therefore, it has the, the by screening and all that. I'm not going to go into details. <coughs> I just wanted to draw the analogy, which is going to be important. I'm going to go to higher dimensions. So, so I, need, I want to do this. OK, so let me do this problem in a slightly different way, more Field theory kind of a point of view. Suppose I now take my phase field and which has this global symmetry shift, and I'm going to gauge that symmetry. By gauging it, what I mean is we're going to couple this phase field to a background gauge field, not dynamic, I'm not going to sum over the configuration, it's going to be a probe. Imagine doing the electromagnetic flow of the fluid. Okay, so we have this. So, in particular, if I choose A to have a curl which is equal to the vorticity, this field actually will produce vortices in A. Okay, so, I don't need to actually look for a singular configuration as I did before. So, I did before. I can blame that into this. Yeah. Okay, so I can do that. And now I'm going to do again another way of uh, solving a simple problem in a complicated way. This is a Gaussian problem, can do this in real, any, any baby can do that. But, um, uh, but instead of that, I'm going to do a Herbert Sotonovich transformation. Yeah. 
In the Hubble's autonomic transformation, I'm going to do is to decouple this quadratic form into something which is going to be linear and some other weight. So linear means since this is going to be a vector field, I need another vector field. My house Ratonovich field will look like a vector field. It's going to smell to an H field. And I need a quadratic term. And notice that G goes to one over G by virtue of Gaussian integral. The, I think that's good. Okay. Um, and then you see that if I integrate over theta, that forces essentially A to have to be divergence free because essentially if I do an integration by parts here, if you allow me to do that, I'm going to be a little sloppy now. Okay, so the divergence of A would be zero and I can solve that by saying, well, if it is zero, if the divergence zero means that A has to be a curl of somebody else, which I'm going to call <laughs> they did before. So I can rewrite this partition function in this so-called dual form. So notice that here's the duality now, okay, in, this, in doing this. So the, the path integral now, instead of looking like this, instead of g has a, one over g has a g, and has this imaginary term, which is present here. Now, I still have the problem that this is going to diverge unless the integral of omega is actually zero everywhere. In other words, unless the total vorticity vanishes. So you still need to impose that condition for this to work. Okay. So the duality now is to exchange this phase field with this other phase field as in Cauchy Riemann and G into one over G. Okay, so again, it's the same story. Okay, so let me exploit that. Let, let me sum over vortex configurations. So I have, I'm going to now assume okay, that this is a sum of data functions as I did before. Okay, here they are. And I'm going to give some weight so that I want to suppress things with higher vorticity with a core energy, which I'm going to call U. So the quantity E to the minus U over T being small is usually called a fugacity in this language. It tells me how, how expensive it is to produce these uh, vortices. And if I, in that limit, I can sum to the sum over the vortex configurations explicitly, the ones that contribute have m equals zero, plus or minus one everywhere. And then you end up with an effective theory that looks like this. This theory is known as the sign Roman rule. Now, the coupling constant that enters here, notice that this theory is periodic. This is actually a periodicity of shift by integers, essentially. And that's because it's related to vortices that actually occur. So the correlation function for vortices, this is the operator that essentially associated with vortices. You can compute this trivially, and it has a power law which is 2 pi over g. You, this actually can be used to compute what we call a scaling dimension in the sense of the renormalization group to be pi over g. When this number is actually smaller than two, the vortice is proliferate. We say that this operator is relevant. When this number is greater than two, two being the dimensional space, two here, <laughs> then they are irrelevant. And G equals the place where this is equal to two is where this quantity G is pi over two again in units. This is the same as the KT argument. So the free energy argument that I used before is the same as the normalization group argument in terms of by expanding powers of the cosine. In the low temperature regime, on the other, so on the other hand, if you compute the order parameter correlator, which takes a little bit more algebra, we will do that. You get a similar expression, except that G is replaced by one over G. And so the dimensions now get flipped. And that means that at the critical point of this coastal established transition, this exponent here is actually one quarter. And this was, this exponent was measured famously 
by John Reppy, I think, for the first time in superfluid, by actually using a personal method, essentially by looking at essentially the stiffness of the helicity modulus. He, he measured the helicity modulus of the superfluid, which is actually a, essentially measures its quantity. Here is a well, jump in the superfluid density is proportional to this one quarter. Which is Okay, how much do I have? Thumbs up. Can you see if I uh, yeah, I need to go to three dimensions afterwards, so we do that tomorrow. Okay, so it's a good place. Have one minute for questions. Take the in person. Yes. Uh, can you explain how you went from the first partition function to the second partition function in a little bit more detail? Yeah, what I did here. Okay, so what I said is the oh, background field. I mentioned sliding. Sorry? Sliding. <laughs> yeah, from yeah, which one? Oh, from here to here? Yes. What I did is to say, you see, these M's can be summed over, with, except for the weight, they can be summed over in the panel. So if the coupling U is large, but it's the same with quantity to the minus U or T is small, I can essentially sum over the values M equals plus minus one or zero everywhere. And then that essentially beats the I see, so you, you have to read on the CH there. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's why there is actually a spacing square. That has to be there because this has to be dimension two, and this is superficially dimensionless. So we have to have units of the inverse area. Okay, next, um, I have a question. The first action, partial you know, theta minus a. This one? No, no, the previous one. Yeah, just the first yeah. one. Um, if theta is a compact, uh, yeah. The variable, yeah. then uh, A is also periodic. Yeah. And then the partial mu of theta is the R, and A is a compact variable. How can we subtract the compact variable? So they are both, no, okay. theta has periodicity, and A, as I showed you, has to have this integer value. So we're going to only, so in principle, you can use any A you want. It's a variable too. There's no, no limitation. This field can be infinitesimally small. I mean, imagine that you have a magnet and you apply an electron superconductor, you play an electron field. Super space and superconductor field can be a super Okay, so here you want to specialize this to these two particular vector potentials whose curl is equal to this. So that's where the addition is. So this condition that this is the sum of delta function with the integer weight. In other words, the denotes about the compensation of the conversion. But if I actually want to gauge the U1 integral over there. Well, okay, so this is a, that's how I do it. I restrict it. If you want to do this for the same maybe we can talk about this. There's another mode of the abelian picture, which we have to be more careful with. But it's the same story. The only thing that happens here is actually because the once the gauge fields are dynamic and they take the full new one dive, the work is not very strict. So you get, essentially you get carbonized. The gauge field becomes massive because of fixing. So it's not, it's a different view. So here we're using this vector potential as a device to essentially produce all this. It's really By the way, this idea goes back to some beautiful papers by Leo Kahn. He actually pioneered this. So, you need some symmetry. So, there are examples where you do have that. 
this is the case of Christians. So he said, I'd like to know the parameters of the director to be as a Christian for us to identify. In that case, you look at what it is. So you can have a question. You have maybe one person who asks you, basically, do you have a question? Then you can help. You can have a question for the person to talk about what you see in the situation. Well, the density way. It's exactly that. Thank you for the question. Maybe the chance to talk about it. <laughs> uh, at some like, like ages ago, you just mentioned the uh, product. Uh, all organizations give you a component space. Yes. Uh, and you also mentioned this uh, surpassing if you have this eight space. Yes. So what's the... Uh, I come to that in the next lecture. There, is, there are some misunderstandings. Okay. In the case of resizing H theory, the answer is clear because this operator actually does go to first In theories with the different symmetry group, you have to be careful. Yeah, I, and I, then it depends on the on the charge. But we'll talk about that next time. Okay. So keep the question in your yeah. <laughs> Uh, for the fact that a uh, 3D dimensional, a uh, 3D duality, and yeah. that uh, somehow depend on the base manifold. On the what? Uh, base manifold, like yes. the, whether you choose the torus or sphere. Yes. yes, that's true. Right. We'll talk about that too. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to hear more reflection? I, can't. <laughs> take, I will yeah. take over somebody else. As <laughs> you. Uh, yeah. As you increase G, uh, so I saw that I think uh, the transition, the M equal to two uh, uh, vertices don't matter, but if you increase further, is there an intermediate regime where M equals to one vertices have proliferated, but two have not, and then two proliferated? We have proliferated, one's one proliferates, one of them. Essentially, because once they proliferate, the logarithmic interaction becomes weak. Essentially, you end up in a plasma flex, which at the very beginning <laughs> is very dense, but then as G temperature increases, it becomes more and more dense. There's some non-monotonic behavior, but what the current simulation sometimes is confused with the, with the phase transition, just a bump, and the heat capacity is associated with this process of going from the weak, essentially, from the late region to the more dense region. But this is it's a smooth. But, uh, but they don't affect the transition point? No, they don't because, I mean, it would be in the case of, that she asked me if the if thing that actually proliferated, but what this is in theory, we have to do one when the physics is a little different, but uh, the analog of it is like that. So once the fundamental vortex, the fundamental vortex, the vortex can proliferate, then it's we know that, and, and then the other ones essentially will do it simply because the energy entropy argument is already changed. <laughs> you only have short range interaction. Yeah. Essentially, the rest. All right, so our time is up. Let's thank you, Professor Bakken.